It's a, a people, it's a community, it's a life, it's a heart, it's a spirit. That's a question. The heck would you want a picture of a tattoo of a thousand dollars on your penis for? What makes this book so relevant, even though it was written over a hundred years ago, is that it's about terrorism. The work, sex, uh, cars, bars, broads. And the children, anything. it's building on what they have. They have great imagination. Dementia. It's not a diagnosis, it's a set of symptoms. And he kept explaining to me that I wasn't gay. That you cannot be gay, you just the cannot. The main thing is to be open and honest and be, you know, true to yourself. Hello and welcome to Talking About. Tonight we have a very interesting topic for our live show. We are live on uh, May 13th of 2004 and we are discussing uh, marriage equality. And my guest tonight is a marriage equality advocate, Anthony Brown. Welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Okay, and I, uh, marriage equality advocate is somewhat, uh, is it generalizing it a little bit? Uh, it's an interesting title, but it's fairly accurate. Uh, I've uh, uh, been involved in the same-sex marriage movement for about four years now uh, on many different levels, one with my organization uh, called The Wedding Party, which was founded in the year 2000 uh, to help celebrate uh, same-sex relationships and to educate the public on the need for uh, offering the rights and the benefits of marriage to all couples, same-sex couples included. Uh, and it really, it's been a, a kind of a wild ride because the last uh, four years we've sort of operated under the radar, but now that marriage, uh, marriage equality and same-sex marriage is such a critical issue, it's, it's such an out there issue, uh, our organization has really sort of moved forward and stepped up. Well, it's, uh, the, the issue somewhat exploded uh, in February of 2004. Yeah, it, it, it's, I think the groundwork was really laid uh, honestly in, in uh, June of last year when the Supreme Court decided the uh, Lawrence versus Texas case, uh, which in that case they basically said that gay and lesbian relationships are who you choose to have an intimate relationship. The government cannot criminalize that. Uh, they reversed a horrible, very homophobic decision from 1986 called Bowers v. Hardwick, and that really... Uh, sort of opened the door for a new wave of sort of understanding about gay relationships and also I think in the community it, emp it empowered us to be able to actually um, ask for marriage. I think it, it, for many of us it was so beyond comprehension. Nobody really thought that it, you know, it would really be a viable issue. But uh, all of a sudden it's here and we're all talking about it. And I've even read that uh, people in the community thought they already had the right in some, area, in some cases and people just don't realize uh, what they might be missing out on and what they're being denied. Yeah, that's very true. It's, and it's, it's not just in the community. Uh, a lot of people around the country believe they've either heard a story about the Hawaii case, uh, they've either heard about you know, Vermont and they, their uh, misunderstanding what civil unions really are. And there are very many gay people who think that somewhere there's the, the right to get married. But really, and there's no state in, in the country now that provides gay and lesbian couples the ability to get married. And that may, that may soon be changing as well. Yeah, it, which is really exciting. I mean, as of Monday, May 17th, uh, Massachusetts is going to be granting uh, marriage licenses to same-sex couples, which is, it, which is huge. Uh, it's, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. And the, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, in an incredibly eloquent and very beautiful and a very socially um, aware uh, decision, uh, granted us this right. And they basically said that it's, it has to be marriage. It can't be civil unions. It can't be anything less because it's an equality issue. What is the difference between a marriage and a civil union? Oh, that's a that's a very good question, and I think that the answer really is uh, there are many different answers to that. It's different. Say, is there a simple answer? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think from a legal, from a purely legal perspective, uh, there's only one state right now that has established civil unions for gay and lesbian couples, and that's Vermont. Uh, no other state has a civil union status already in the law. Um, so a couple from Vermont at this point could not move to another state and have their civil union recognized anywhere. Uh, also, there's no federal civil union protection. So right now, basically, a civil union only protects the gay and lesbian couples who instituted that union in Vermont. But the, none of the 1,138 federal rights that go along with marriage are conveyed in a civil union uh, right. from, from a legal perspective. Uh, yeah, from, I mean, that is basically 
it. I mean, and are we we're talking mainly from a legal perspective, and we're we're kind of putting the religious aspect on the shelf for the moment. <clears throat> well, with civil unions, the distinction between civil unions and marriage, I think before the religious argument, you really have to sort of deal with the emotional argument and the equality argument of that, because by saying uh, gay and lesbian couples don't deserve the full uh, treatment that marriage gives, you're basically relegating them to a second-class citizenship. You're saying that, you know, they don't deserve marriage like, like we do, or something, you know, it, it's, it's creating a second-class citizenship, basically. And, uh, and uh, I've heard you know, parents of gay children say, I want my son, my gay son, to have the same opportunity to come to me and say, hey, dad, I'm getting married as my non-gay son or my non-gay daughter. You know, it really does create sort of a, a second-class status for gay and lesbian couples. And we do have Anne on the line. Whenever Anne is, wants to chime in with her question, uh, we will answer it to uh, the best of our ability. Anne, are you with us? Hello. Hi, Anne. How are you? Hi. I'm, I'm very sad when I see discussions like this because I'd like to know what the public is afraid of. I'm a heterosexual. I'm married. My husband and I spent uh, seasons on Fire Island taking care of somebody. We met a lot of gay men and women, and it was the best experience of our life. I want to know what people are afraid of. And all my adult life, I'd live next door to people screaming, yelling, wife abuse, spousal abuse. <laughs> Never saw it with gay men. Never saw it with gay women. What are people afraid of? Love is love, and it upsets me so badly because the friends I have in the gay community are better than any brother I would have had bloodline. What are people afraid of? Yeah, and that's an incredible question, and you really kind of hit the nail on the head with that. P people are very afraid, I think, to, uh, that... Well, I've tried to imagine myself, what are people afraid of? Uh, is it, is it uh, a religious judgment? Is it a moral judgment? Never. But uh, I think, honestly, it boils down to feeling like you've lost control over your world or over society. You know, if a man can marry a man or if a woman can marry a woman, what is this world coming to? And, and for me personally, I understand as a gay man feeling like I don't have that kind of control over my society, uh, particularly in an equality perspective. And what I try to focus on when I uh, talk to people about having this conversation uh, with other people, I tell them, try to, try to find what unites you, try to find what you have in common, because the, when you do that, you double your chances of at least them hearing what you have to say. And I do have to add, Anne, that you probably are one of the most powerful marriage advocates because, uh, because of your successful marriage and because of your uh, ability to speak to this issue and to see that this issue is an equality issue. So uh, I appreciate your call and I appreciate your statements. The depravity in the country of people who think that it's, it's so wrong. Love is love, for God's sake. What, how do you hurt somebody when you're in love? How do you hurt somebody when you have to... What hurts me is that I've seen men lose their partners to AIDS and they couldn't even be in the room with their partner for 10, 15, 20 years because they had no right to be with them. Meanwhile, they sacrificed their life to be with their partner. How disgusting. I wish to God that people would believe that God doesn't want this. Jesus Christ did not put down homosexual people. That was the men's interpretation in the Bible. Jesus would have never turned his back on anyone, let alone a gay community, if it, if, if, if it invokes love. So uh, please, people, if anything, learn to love each other and learn to embrace people who love each other. They're not hurting you. Nobody's hurting you. Open your arms and open your hearts to people. That, that's what this lousy world is, is not doing. And, and I wish you so much luck, and I, I, I urge anyone who could have anything in a political realm to help the gay community get what's coming to them, for God's sake. Well, thank That's you. Nice. Thank you very much for your call. And, and uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think you prove that uh, when gay and lesbian uh, couples have the right to marry, that they're not going to be hurting anybody else, you know, that, that it's not going to be the disintegration of society or... Uh, or the, you know, the degradation of the institution of marriage, which I think is a, a big myth out there. And the institution of marriage, which has pretty much a 50% divorce rate? True, and that's and one of the things that Anne had mentioned, which is really, uh, you know, uh, really the point is if you want to deal with the institution of marriage, then touch on what's really affecting marriage, the divorce rate, poverty, health care, domestic violence, the issues that really directly affect 
the divorce rate or directly right. affect couples in a marriage. So, I mean, is it oversimplifying it to say clean your own house before you come into mine? You now, there's, you know, there's so many ways of looking at this <laughs> issue. I, you know, I, I absolutely, I certainly, you know, agree with that. He who, you know, has no sin cast the first stone. There's so many different ways of looking at it. Um, I think a lot of people get stuck on their moral understanding of homosexuality or their moral judgment of homosexuality. I've, uh, I've sat on a number of panels where members from the uh, anti-equality opposition have constantly, you know, a question will come out, a very specific question about what are the rights and benefits of marriage or how does civil union and marriage weigh against one another and, and their answers are, have absolutely nothing to do with the question, but they're designed to sort of repetitively um, attack and, and say shocking things that appeal to the moral sensibilities of the person that they're trying to talk to. So they're talking in sound bites. They're talking in sound bites, but they're also sort of trying to uh, misdirect the conversation. If they can, you know, force someone to live in their world of un misunderstanding about homosexuality, then that person doesn't have the option of being able to really see it as an equality issue or, or a, human's, a human rights issue, which it really is. Right, and is a lot of it people are just being afraid of change as well? I, I, I do think so. And, and you had mentioned before the, the interracial marriage movement. And, right. and a number of people, I, I think there are similarities to the racial equality movement. I think there are just as many differences with the racial equality movement and the gay, gay rights movement. However, the interracial marriage issue and the same-sex marriage issue are, are literally almost identical. The same arguments that were posed against interracial marriage are, you hear them today, almost, almost verbatim. Uh, they're just amazingly almost comic quotes from judges on a federal level and on a state level saying if, if uh, black, blacks can marry whites, you know, the, the product will be sickly and effeminate children. I mean, absolutely amazingly uh, crazy comments right. that are based from this fear, this misunderstanding. And the same uh, institution of marriage arguments and the downfall of society arguments were put forth. And largely those arguments uh, for the interracial marriage movement were couched in religion as well, were based in their moral sensibilities about the issue of, of racism mixing. Um, are there any places in the world where there is same-sex marriage allowed? There are, there are, surprisingly enough, sometimes we forget that, you know, we think we're living in a vacuum here, but the, the Netherlands was the first uh, country, uh, I believe it was in 2001, where they opened marriage to all uh, citizens of the Netherlands. Since has, has their society collapsed? No, the sky is still intact as far as, I'm, as, far as I've heard <laughs> the latest weather reports say. Um, Belgium has, has come along and now Canada. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because we, uh, I think America can be very insular and we tend not to look at other countries' experiences and other countries' uh, development. And really the Netherlands, Belgium, and Canada, Canada in particular because they're neighbors to the north. Right. They are really dealing with this issue uh, you know, head on, just yeah. like we are. And, and we, we as Americans tend to look at ourselves as the innovators of the world in uh, social issues as well as many other areas and in this instance it, it's just not the case. Yeah, it's kind of surprising. Um, you know, you, you hear the sound bites that are going on now about, you know, the, the horrible atrocities overseas and, and the reasons why we are going and, you know, to, we, we do tout ourselves as a country that, of social reform and, and social justice. Yet this one issue, it seems like it's still okay to call someone a fag or it's still okay to hit a gay person. You know, it's, it's right. the one sort of uh, remaining area that hasn't really been dealt with it. You know, if your child came home from school and said, uh, mommy, someone called me the N-word, you know, you, right. would, you would go to school and you would talk to that principal. Uh, well, I mean, I just look at, you, you said, uh, instead of saying the word, you said the N-word. Uh, and society has stigmatized the use of that word except within the own community. Mm -hmm particular community to, to say that word within the community is somewhat acceptable if used properly but for to say it outside of the community is not and to say you know fag dyke queer mm -hmm. with a nasty inflection is still common and acceptable and heard in almost every schoolyard exactly uh, <clears throat> and some of the uh, other parallels between 
the iteration. Are there any other parallels? Well, yeah, it's it's, um, uh, it's kind of interesting. The first state court that found for uh, California State Supreme Court in 1947 was the first state court that said uh, interracial marriage is uh, a right and it should not be uh, criminalized. It took 19 years until the state or until, excuse me, until the federal Supreme Court in probably the most appropriately named Supreme Court case, Loving versus Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, before they actually acted on it and struck down the remaining uh, states' interracial marriage bans. So if we're looking at uh, an analogy, you know, we may be facing a couple of decades of uh, you know, strife uh, about this issue. I know Sandra Day O'Connor, the Supreme Court judge, said, uh, when asked what she thought was the most uh, sort of pressing or engaging issue that, that will be before the court over the next two decades, she said it's going to be how the law treats gay and lesbian relationships. Which, yeah. And, and just on a personal front for yourself, I mean, what led you to this point? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting, it's a very circuitous story that a lot of people don't necessarily understand. But I moved to New York to be an actor. I was okay. fortunate enough to to go to Juilliard. So when I got out, I, uh, I uh, was able to work for a while. Segued from acting into uh, a, a career as a alternative healthcare provider, as a licensed massage therapist. Okay. And I worked on. Uh, uh, communities at risk, HIV communities and, and cancer communities, and working with that, uh, with those people, I had a client named Tom Stoddard, who was the founder of Lambda Legal, okay. which is the organization that uh, represented Lawrence and Garner in the big sodomy case in Texas. And then through my association with him, I realized if I want to be an advocate for this community, I need to go to law school. And so I went to law school. And, uh, okay, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a good... Uh, Point to pause on. We do have another caller at 718-460-9802. We have Barbara on the line. Barbara? Hi. I just want to say I'm so glad you're doing this show. Um, I have watched Talking About Before, and you always come up with some great shows. Um, this is a, a wonderful topic, and I totally agree with Anne. Just wanted to get that point in. I have no question. No. <laughs> just enjoying the show. Thank you. May, may I please ask you to go and tell your friends and family that you watched and how you felt about it. I certainly will. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And law school. So uh, I chose my law school, Brooklyn Law School, because Nan Hunter was a professor there. And Nan Hunter uh, was the founder of the Gay and Lesbian Project at the ACLU. So I was fortunate enough to not only be a student of hers, but to do well enough in a class that she asked me to be her research assistant. Okay. And we uh, sort of forged this uh, wonderful learning relationship uh, where I was sort of privy to one of the greatest legal minds about the issue of equality for the gay and lesbian community. And, um, and through, uh, through my experience with her, I uh, had a summer internship at Lambda. I actually got a chance to work on the Lawrence versus Texas brief uh, when we asked the Supreme Court to hear the case, I did some research for the brief. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and that experience has led me to today, I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate to have found a law firm that shares my uh, commitment to the community and commitment to equality. And I'm now the head, uh, the head of the non-traditional family and estates division of a small firm uh, called McKenna, Siracusano, and Chinesi which is based in Long Island, but we have Manhattan offices. But they're wonderful, and they've given me the ability to sort of uh, uh, fulfill my dream, which was to help gay and lesbian families protect their relationships. You know, there's certain legal documentation that you can create that approximate marriage, but they aren't marriage. So, so it's... Uh, so, and they're, they're just to, to approx for the approximation, you have to jump through you know, an infinite number of legal hoops just to get the same benefits that one document holds. Exactly. It's, it's, it's amazing that, the, uh, you know, and, and it's not just, it's not just document, it's not just a will and a living will, and it's a bulletproof will. It's something that uh, can't be attacked and, and may possibly be attacked if you don't have a, a good relationship with your family. It's uh, a document that allows you to visit your partner in the hospital. Uh, you know, it's, it's a document that removes liability from funeral directors so you can have access to your partner's remains or make the decisions about the final, uh, you, know, um, you know, the final circumstances right. of your partner's death. So it's, it's, it's uh, helpful to have these documents. And I believe it's critical to have them. But again, 
it's not marriage. Right. And we do have, uh, we've got Sonny back. So whenever, whenever Sonny's ready, uh, just ask away and we will do our best to answer you to the best okay, of our ability. Sonny? Today. Hi, Sonny, you there? Yes, I'm here. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good, good. Uh, nice topic. Good. Uh, uh, I'm enjoying the topic. Anyhow, I need to ask, though, not speaking from a biblical point of view or anything, I just want to find out, you're representing gay and lesbians, and while you have your views and everything else, just want to find out. While we respect gays and lesbians have their rights and they want to be together and everything else, uh, if life has to go on, if we have to reproduce, where is it going to come from? Well, uh, that's uh, an argument that's often made by the anti-quality opposition that you know marriage is made because of procreation. Um, if that argument were true, then uh, women over the age of menopause wouldn't be able to get married, or couples who choose not to have children wouldn't be able to get married. And gay and lesbian families exist. Gay and lesbian families uh, are out there uh, adopting uh, in creative family arrangements because they want to have families. Well, so you it's, know, not a, it's not a strict uh, issue of procreation. It, procreation certainly is part of marriage, but it's not the uh, only part of marriage. You know, while, you know, while people in menopause or stay to people who have children, God forbid, you know, there's always room for adoption for out, out of normal, uh, you know, reproduction cycle. I'm sorry, say that last part again. Uh, uh, well, whatever is that, unfortunately, people who can't have children, or, you know, uh, uh, whatever the case might be, that somebody can have children, I mean, there's always room for adoption because of reproduction on the normal side. Exactly, exactly. Right. There's always room for adoption with gay and lesbian families as well. Yeah, there's so many children out there in need of homes. Pardon me? It's not a normal lifestyle. It wasn't meant to be. You know, it's, a, it's interesting, it's interesting, Sonny, that you mentioned that because as, as we were talking about early, Canada is also dealing with this issue. And a very uh, important study was just released from the Department of Justice in Canada uh, where they were looking specifically at what you're talking about, about how uh, children are affected when they have gay and lesbian parents. And the study that, that the Department of Justice came out with actually said that children of gay and lesbian uh, families often fare better because the relationships of the parents are more uh, creative, the division of labor is more uh, equal in gay and lesbian uh, parenting situations, and that the children are often uh, either do better in school or often are, you know, are just the same, that there's no detriment to having a gay or lesbian parent. So I think, I think Sonny, what you're addressing is, is your own moral understanding of what homosexuality is. What is bit moral, but also to understand that, you know, if, if I would have to accept this lifestyle, you know, where it's going to lead, you know, your children, if let's assume you should adopt, where, do, where does those children, what their mentality would be, what would lifestyle would they choose, what would they think, I have two dads and is this good for me also, or should I get a wife? No, I understand what you're saying, and that's, a, that's a, actually a very good point, because um, I think when I do have children, because my partner and I are planning to adopt, uh, I would certainly raise them as if they were going to be heterosexual. The majority of the population is heterosexual. Um, I, I doubt very seriously that I could teach someone to be homosexual, because it's something I know from personal experience that you were born with, that it's something that you, uh, that you feel from your innermost core, the same way uh, that you know, that you would be attracted to your wife or to your girlfriend. Uh, and I would assume that my children would also be, have their attraction to the opposite sex, and I would certainly foster that. However, if they did turn out to be homosexual, I would cer certainly love them just as much as, uh, as I would if they were not. Well, it's good to hear that at least you, you are going to be leading them in the right path. You know, maybe you should become heterosexual, uh, heterosexual excuse me. But, uh, you know, it's good to do that. But uh, <laughs> I still, being, uh, you know, I mean, not homosexual, I don't want to say, but uh, I can understand it, and it's kind of difficult for me, and that's why I'm calling, that's why I want to understand for the children of, you know, for later years, what's going to happen if everybody should adopt the lifestyle. As you say, it's not something you adopt, it's something you're born with. Yeah, and you know, I'm so glad, Sonny, that you called, because you really are wrestling with this issue in an honest way, and I really appreciate that. I think a lot of people are very much in your same situation and they feel like 
uh, you know, they, they, they don't know where to go for answers and, and they feel like they can't speak out. Or, but I really do appreciate your honesty with this because I think a lot of people feel the same way you do. And I, I hope that in being able to talk about it that maybe you have a, a different understanding than possibly before you called. I do appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Right, thanks for your call. Enjoy the program. Take care. Bye thanks. Bye. And um, come tomorrow, I'll have some links up on the www.talkingabout.info website um, where you can get some more information on the topic. But we are going to continue uh, with this. Uh, where did we leave off before? Um, uh, yeah, we, we were talking uh, sort of about my journey that brought me here. I'm incredibly fortunate to, to be where I am now. I really do uh, feel like I'm living the life that I was supposed to live. Um, uh, and, and working with gay and lesbian couples uh, it really, it, uh, it's really an education process, I think, and it's wonderful when, uh, you know, when I help to create the documentation to protect their families, that I see them sort of empowered, and, and they realize they can take a deep breath and they can relax, that they don't have to worry that, you know, they're going to be caught in one of those really horrible situations that you often hear about, about uh, being denied access to your loved one when they're in the hospital, or, yes. or, or, or having someone taken away from you. Uh, because uh, something happens and they're not able to care for themselves. I mean, many years ago, I had a friend who who was partnered with somebody who was ill and did pass away. And that one day, he came home to the apartment, and half of the half of the belongings were gone. And the sister of his partner had had a key, and she came in and she just cleaned out whatever she thought was her brother's. Yep. And he probably had no legal recourse. No, and he just. Isolated for quite a long time after, yeah, after that, and it just it took away from his mourning process. No, absolutely. I mean, I can only imagine putting putting myself in his situation to just to lose the person that you've been with for so long, and then having to deal with that kind of you know right. Because I mean, fear. I think that not only that fear. I mean, like just to reiterate the loss of the mourning process. I mean, going going through someone's belongings and saying goodbye as you go through their belongings is a valid part and, and just it completely invalidated the relationship. Yeah, I think it's a, that's also uh, something that a lot of people take for granted. If a, if a parent dies, much less a spouse, going through their things and you know, understanding what your life was like with them and remembering all of the, those moments. But it's, uh, it's also interesting because uh, not only are our relationships um, uh, when one partner dies, often at risk from being attacked by a family member, but there are certain government uh, provisions, there are certain tax provisions, which, uh, for instance, if, if uh, a non-married couple owns uh, property as joint tenants with the right of survivorship, meaning that when one dies, the other one gets the, all of the property, right. um, if they're not married, the government will automatically assume through a tax structure that the person who died owned all of it, and so they'll tax the surviving spouse on if if it meets the estate tax limit they'll tax the surviving spouse on property that they already own so n unmarried couples have to keep very meticulous records about their individual contributions to a particular piece of property and like you said before that you know having to do that and the mourning process at the same time it just doesn't go together what are some of the things that people can do to protect themselves uh, certainly i think the baseline protection really is creating a will and creating a will that uh, and when you when you speak with your attorney about it, well, first of all, let me let me say I, I, a lot of people are under the misconception that they can just run out to the store and buy a will, and that's fine. When you are a same-sex couple, there are so many other things that you have to understand. If the will is not absolutely perfect and in accordance with New York statute, it can easily be uh, attacked by a family member, and all of a sudden your relationship and everything that you built together is gone. So a, a will is certainly uh, sort of the first step, and there's certain elements to the will that you can actually uh, incorporate, and a good uh, uh, non-traditional estate attorney can uh, inform you about you know, certain clauses to put in to, you know, and certain strategies in the writing of the will. Um, uh, also, medical documentation like a living will uh, and a health care proxy. The living will, I don't know if you're familiar with the Terry Schiavo case. Not in Florida, that. it's a, a husband and wife, and the wife, I, I believe she was in a car accident, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but she was kept alive on a feeding tube. Okay, and yes, the husband wanted great. to have the feeding tube removed, and the family didn't want to have the feeding tube right. removed. A living will is the document that, and this, regardless of, of your sexual orientation, uh, you are allowed to, in this document to say what kinds of treatment you want and what kinds of treatment you don't want given certain life-threatening uh, circumstances. For instance, if there's no reasonable hope 
for recovery. Um, the, the healthcare proxy is the document that allows me to give my partner the right to make those medical decisions for me if I'm not able to. Much like a husband would have their wife make those decisions right. if they needed to. Um, other documents that same-sex couples need, uh, there's something called a priority visitation directive, which allows you to go, go to a hospital and visit your partner in a hospital. Um, hospital administrators are very worried about liability. Right. So uh, if you give them this legal document that removes their liability, then they'll let you go in and visit. Um, uh, there was another case uh, about four years ago, a lesbian couple, uh, one was in a car accident, and uh, she was severely disabled, and the court appointed a guardian for her because she couldn't take care of herself anymore. There's another document that allows you to tell the court, if this ever happens to me, I want you to appoint this person as my guardian. So essentially, you have to write a book to to get ba the benefits of the one piece of paper. Basically, yeah. And yeah, that's something of an oversimplification. It's, yeah, it is, and it's also a very expensive process at the same time, and, uh, and something, unfortunately, that... Uh, it, is, it is necessary for gay and lesbian couples to have that sense of security, especially if they have children, especially if they have children. Okay, and I just want to pause briefly. And if you're just joining us, I want to welcome you to talking about, we are discussing marriage equality to, uh, on this live program on May, May 13, 2004. And we are taking your calls at 718-460-9802. My guest is an, a marriage equality advocate, Anthony Brown. And uh, feel free to chime in anytime and... We'll answer your question to the best of our ability. Okay. And we were discussing some of the documentation that people need to approximate marriage, being that mar you know, marriage is not equal at this point. Exactly. It's, it's a very interesting. I think people sort of woke up a little bit when uh, the recent Britney Spears five-minute marriage happened. And they realized uh, in Las Vegas, in a matter of minutes, a paper was signed and all of these rights were all of a sudden conveyed when uh, gay and lesbian couples have to sort of jump through the proverbial hoops to make sure that even the basic protections are, are available. And especially, especially uh, gay and lesbian families with children. Um, uh, simply because if, if there's a non-biological parent uh, and the biological parent dies and they haven't named the non-biological parent as the guardian, then, then there's a, the court determines who is the guardian in that case. So there are documents that allow you to nominate a guardian for your children uh, that, uh, that are essential for families with children. Um, it's, it's, it's always sort of amazed me, uh, and, uh, and it made me think what the world would be like if uh, a, a child of a gay and lesbian family uh, and knew that their parents were married, just like everybody else's parents. What the sort of critical shift that would create and the ripple effect down the road because as we were talking about earlier uh, gays and lesbians still remain the you know the one group of people that it's okay to bash it's okay to talk bad about them it's okay to make jokes right I mean like I said in, in every schoolyard you hear the derogatory comments absolutely and it's 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 if if someone if a parent went in to talk to the administrator of the school and said someone called my child a fag I want to know what you're going to do about that. It would be amazing to see what, if, if more and more people started doing that and holding the school system accountable for protecting their children. It would really create, I think, a future where gay bashing and, and, and violence against gay and lesbian Americans would, would really be reduced. Is it a matter of just saying, don't say that word? Or it's, you know, I think, I think it's a multi-layered problem. I think certainly uh, there has to be an admonishment and there has to be an understanding between the child and the parent and between the school and the child that that's not the right word. But it also involves um, gay and lesbians coming out and, and uh, going into peer programs in schools and talking about, hey, I'm a gay person. This is what it's like to be gay. Do I look like all of those crazy things that you hear about? You know, go ahead and say all of the jokes now. Get them out of the way. Now let's talk about what it's really like. Right. You know, to have, have role models out there. So gay and lesbian children, when they start to understand that something's different about them and uh, something is going on, that they can look to, s to someone, you know, in, a, in a, uh, uh, an adult position, an adult role, and say, wait a minute, if, if they can do it, maybe I can do it. You know, and, and at least, at the very least, they would have a forum to talk about it and to talk about it without the fear of somebody hitting them or putting them down or calling them names. 
Right, and it, it can also help to provide role models within the community. I mean, Absolutely. if somebody, if a young person is questioning, and they're being told over and over that you know this is bad, this is evil, there's nothing good about this, and then yeah, you know, if if you present to them, um, say, you know, an openly gay firefighter, yeah, you know, hey, exactly. Yeah, you know, I mean, we've had we've had people from Firefly on live uh, before, and they do go out and speak, and yeah, you know, it. It helps a lot, and they've mentioned in the past that you know, the kids are sh you know, shy about it, but they'll come up to them afterward and say, "Right, yeah, thank you." Right, yeah. exactly, it, exactly. It's 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 a very very interesting point because every gay and lesbian person goes through their own coming out process, and it's often very difficult. It's often very emotional, uh, and. And once you're on the other side of that, sometimes people don't want to put their sexuality out there or put their, you know, their persona, their identity out there. But it really, uh, it's really important that gay and lesbian Americans come out to their friends, come out to their families, come out to their coworkers and their bosses, and let them know, hey, we're here. You know, I'm the same person I was five minutes ago before I told you this. Right. So, you know, what are your concerns? What are your feelings about it? Right, and just kind of shifting it back to the to the marriage front or the equality, you know, come out as a couple. Exactly, exactly. And more and more people, I think, are doing that. They have their picture at their workstation of their partner or their partner and their children, and, and they're making it an environment that's open. You know, and if somebody walks by and they have a problem with it, and, you know, you can, you can talk about that problem. I think having these conversations is so, uh, it's so vitally important. Um, it's one of the reasons I'm wearing this. This is a new um, project from uh, the wedding party. We created this and in conjunction with marriage equality. It's a marriage awareness ribbon. It's uh -huh. two white ribbons that are together, and they stand for love and equality. And okay. they're designed to start conversations. So we can actually begin understanding, like what Sonny said when he called in. I thought that was so wonderful that he has, you know, real, real issues with this. And real, right. you know, he's wrestling with this on a real personal level. And by virtue of the fact that we're here, we could talk about it. We could create right. a safe space for him to be able to talk about and it was what he great wants. That he, it, we spoke about it without it becoming, uh, slamming each other. Exactly, verbally. exactly. And I, and I uh, definitely appreciate, you know, Sonny for doing that also. Yes. I think we, we sort of hold ourselves to a higher standard because we're asking to be recognized. We're asking for the same treatment and the same equality. And, and when we come out, um, uh, sometimes as vitriolic as the opposition comes out, then uh, we take away from what we're trying to say. Right. And speaking of recognizing with equality, we have a caller. Uh, just uh, any viewer, feel free to call in at 718-460-9802. And right now we've got Mary on the line. Mary, feel free to jump in whenever you're ready. Hi, how are you? Okay, hi, hi Mary. Mary. Good. Um, you know, your show is very interesting. Um, and uh, what came to mind was the incident in upstate New York where Mayor had, um, had performed ceremony, marriage ceremony, for, I think, uh, for several couples. And then the second time he performed the the marriage, I understand that he was uh, incarcerated. He was supposed to be arrested. Uh, can you give me your comments on that? Oh, that's a, that's a a very uh, interesting and sort of a, an amazing thing that happened. I mean, imagine civil disobedience in the form of people going out and marrying the person that they love. Um, it was a very courageous and a very um, risky endeavor for Mayor West to, to sort of take up. I think he believes in this issue so much that he actually did that. Um, and, and he threw the issue out to the world in a way and said, you know, take a look at this. This is, this is a marriage just like anybody else. Now, the legal ramifications uh, of his doing that, the, the law basically says, there's a, an article in New York law that says uh, that a marriage is not invalid for lack of a marriage certificate. Um, and uh, personally, I believe that was more a procedural law than, uh, than a, a sort of substantive law or a meaningful law. But they basically were saying that those marriages are valid, yet the person who performs a marriage, knowing that they're not going to be issuing a marriage certificate, uh, has committed a crime. And that was what he was arrested for. And uh, the does, dis um, does New York uh, have uh, common law marriage, and can homosexuals come under that uh, umbrella? Well, no, New York law doesn't really uh, provide for common law marriage. There are certain states that do, 
Uh, and uh, in those states, uh, for instance, you've probably heard of uh, the term palimony, which is sort of uh, when a, a non an unmarried couple breaks up, sometimes they'll go to the court for uh, palimony, and they'll, the, the court will base their determination upon what their relationship is. In New York, the, they don't look at the relationship. There's no common law recognition. However, in New York, if, if that unmarried couple has a contract, between the two of them has, uh, say, a domestic partnership agreement, if they're domestic partners. Uh, then, under New York contract law, then they can go to court to determine what would be an equitable division of the property and, and if, the, you know, if there should be some kind of support offered to one another. But as far as looking at the significance of the relationship from a common law perspective, New York doesn't do that. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely, thanks for calling. Good thanks night. for calling. Okay, and we were just starting to touch on, on the wedding party and, and the ribbon. And the ribbon, yes. And it, it's just, it's so important that we actually have this conversation. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in the subway and someone will say, oh, what's that? Because they've seen, you know, all of the other ribbons. They've seen, you know, the, the red ribbon for AIDS and the pink ribbon for breast, breast cancer. cancer. And now they're seeing two white ribbons together and they're sort of in the form with two heads and it's kind of askew, but it's, it's, a, it's a really great conversation starter. And inevitably when somebody asks about it, I take it off and I give it to them. Uh, and uh, and say you know the, you know wear this and we have the conversation about it. So right. what we're doing, uh, what the wedding party marriage equality are doing, we've we've created the design for it and we're working on the distribution for it. And what we would like to do with it is to be able to offer it uh, to sell it, and the proceeds from the sales go to the different marriage organizations that exist. There are a number of marriage organizations that exist now nationally, locally, and we would love to be able to increase their funding, and especially right. in a way that gets the issue out there and gets people talking about it. Okay, and while we're on the topic of the wedding party, mm -hmm. uh, what is the wedding party all about? The wedding party is, uh, the wedding party was created by uh, a woman with a vision. Uh, our executive director, Renee Rotkoff, called her friends together and she said, I have this dream about this beautiful ceremony in Central Park where gay and lesbian couples can celebrate their relationships and where the world can look in and see that's love. That's, uh, that's one of the callers was saying, it's just love. And so uh, she rallied around a, a group of very committed friends. It's an all-volunteer organization, so, okay. uh, so we're, uh, we're, very, uh, we're very committed. Uh, and we uh, produced the, our very first year's commitment ceremony. Okay. And uh, it was amazing because the national press uh, local press, everyone uh, was able to look in and see it, and positive images and happy images and hopeful images of gay couples were all of a sudden all over the media. So it was really quite a wonderful experience. And we're getting ready for our fourth on June 27th, okay. uh, 10 in the morning uh, at 59th and 5th Avenue. Is that the last Sunday in June? That's the last uh, Sunday in June, and we, we kick off the Gay Pride Parade. Okay, and is this the last Sunday in June every year? Yes, Gay Pride is always the last Sunday in June in New York City. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we've got another caller at 718-460-9802. We have Carmine on the line. Carmine, feel free to chime in whenever you're ready. Yes, hello, fellas. How are you? Hey, Carmine. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Uh, listen, just let me say straight off, off the bat, I'm a little bit skeptical about some of this, you know, equal marriage stuff and all that. I'm, my, my, my concern is where does it all end? In other words, uh, how far do we take this thing? Uh, suppose a, a man wants to marry his sister or... Uh, uh, a cousin or a, or a man wants to take two wives and uh, you know I mean is, is there some point that would you say wait a minute this is not kosher here uh, do, do you get my drift I understand what you're saying and I've heard that argument often um, most of the time that argument is put forth by uh, an organization that wants to sort of divert the attention away from what the real issue is which is what you mentioned the equality aspect of it mm -hmm. there already exists in the law uh, criminal bans that deal with incest for very specific reasons. There already exists polygamy laws. Uh, all of this is taken care of and there really is nothing from a legal perspective that would link one to the other. And I think maybe the distinction that's getting blurred a little bit is sort of the moral perspective of it. I think that when people say if a man can marry a man then, then that's morally wrong and a man marrying his sister is morally wrong, and that's the distinction that's made. And I understand why, why people make that distinction, but right. it doesn't carry over to a legal connection, if you understand what I mean. 
you know, well, what about from a religious point of view? How do, how do you feel about that? I mean, and I'm not talking about any one religion in particular. I'm talking about just about every major religion, you know, uh, you know what they say about homosexuality, basically. I mean, uh, be it Jewish or Christian or whatever, you know. Well, that, I'm really glad that you brought that point up because I think a lot of people uh, believe that this movement is trying to uh, sort of cram itself down uh, the throats of the religious community, and that's not true at all. There, the distinction between religious marriage and civil marriage is a very important one. Um, we're not asking for any recognition from any religion at all. It's, a, it's the governmental equality, it's the federal benefits, and it's the state benefits that are completely separate from religion. Uh, but Carmine, you might be interested to know that there are certain religions that uh, embrace the idea of same-sex marriage. Uh, Universalist Unitarianism is very uh, open to the idea of same-sex marriage, and Reform Judaism is very open to uh, the idea of same-sex marriage. I think a lot of people would like you to believe that there's one religious perspective about the issue, but really there, there, are, uh, there are as many different religious perspectives as there are people with, relig <laughs> yeah, people with religious beliefs. Right. So, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I imagine you have to search within your heart and find what works for you, you know, how, how you feel about it. And believe me, I understand. It, is, it was a, an incredibly moral dilemma for me when I realized I was one of those people, I, you know, that I was, you know, the, this person that I, I, I didn't want to be gay, you know, and that was a very, that was a very tough time for me, and it was a very moral issue for me. Right, right. But, um, but, you know, you, you work through the hand that life and God deals you, yeah. and I firmly believe in my spiritual life and my spiritual growth that I'm exactly the person that God wants me to be, and that I'm doing His work on this earth. Well, let me ask you this as a final point here. Uh, Suppose the government would say, would agree to giving you every single right that a married couple has, but yet not call it a marriage, call it something else, whether it be a civil union or whatever word you want to use. But I think that word marriage touches off, and touches off a nerve in people. So in other words, what I'm saying, give you every single right that a married couple has, but not call it a marriage, so not to offend those who believe a marriage should be just between a man and a woman. That's a that's a, another great question, and that's a big actually a big issue in the gay community. Also, um, I guess from a theoretical perspective, if that was the baseline for everybody, if everybody had that what you're describing, gay and straight, and then you could go to your church or your religious body and have your marriage, then that would be great because there would be certain religions that would offer that to same-sex couples. But by, you actually made the point yourself in your question. When, uh, you know, if, if you were not extending full equality to a group of people because it's going to offend a majority of people, then, uh, as you asked me for, before, where does that stop? Yeah. What group down the road is going to be subjected to that sort of logic and that kind of reasoning? Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, I do, and I, listen, I, I can't say I agree with you 100%, but I, uh, you know, I do respect your opinions, and uh, I think that's the thing. We have to respect each other's differences. And listen, we're not going to agree on everything, but the thing is, maybe live and let live, and let you know, let let the greater power decide what's right and what's wrong, not us. You know. You know, Carmine, you're a very wise man. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for calling, Carmine. So, uh, it's good that people are intellectualizing this a little bit more. I. Mean, I when planning the show, I, I was a little bit hesitant because I expected some some vile calls, and I'm glad that people have been rational. Oh, I, you know, I, I I think people who are honest, uh, like Sonny and Carmine, that they really are dealing with something. That's that's not coming from a vile place. You know, that's coming from a very heartfelt place. They're dealing with this dilemma, you know, very very honestly, and uh, and I think I think son, I think uh, excuse me, Carmine was right. There, no one's going to agree on everything. Right. There are going to be differences of opinion, you know, uh, uh, across the spectrum on on every issue. I mean, look at politics. Politics is such a multi-faceted you know, thing. No yeah. one agrees on uh, absolutely everything, and uh, and I think if we can come to a place of peace in that, in our hearts, and we can really listen to what the other side is saying, because I do understand what Sonny and what Carmine are saying. Right. You know, I, I I I get their concerns, and and uh, you know, they're, they're absolutely valid concerns. But um, getting into the political realm, I mean, there are certain politicians who are deliberately attacking 
and, like you said, diverting. And is there anything that could be done to educate them, or do you think they've pretty much had their mind in, in the one track? You know, that's a, that's, a, that's a loaded question because it's, it really is such a political issue. And one of the things that I've come to realize is that politicians' main concern is getting reelected. So what they say and what they advocate for always in the back of their mind has who are the, you know, who is this going to appeal to the most? Given that logic, the change has to come from from us. It has to come from the people. It has to come from their constituents. It has to come from you and I having this conversation, Sonny and right. Carmine calling. You know, it, it, it has to be uh, it has to be us calling and writing our elected f officials and saying, "This is how I feel," and and you're you represent me, and I want to make sure that my voice is heard. And when enough people do that, the politics of politics guarantee that the tide will turn. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Put their job at risk is basically what it boils down to. Yeah, uh, uh, in a way it does. I mean, I, I have often, you know, really believed, in it, and it was one of the callers mentioned Mayor West, Jason West from New Paltz. Um, that, for me, really sort of did reinvigorate my belief in the political system. When someone believes so much in what they're doing and in, and in the message that they're sending out, that they possibly go against the majority of their constituency and uh, to make that statement and then I think we found from you know uh, recent uh, occurrences in New Paltz that they do they do support him and that he is you know that that they appreciate his step also so it's uh, it's it's tough but I think the key is making your voice heard calling the president telling him how you feel writing the president. I, I, I've spoke with many elected officials and they say that a handwritten personal letter mm. gets the most, uh, has the most influence on them. And then a phone conversation. Right. It, well, these days it takes a long time for a handwritten letter to get to a politician. It does. And usually they have a staff of people who screen it. But the equation, it, there's an interesting equation when you send a letter to a politician. Because if you took the time to write that letter, they assume that blank number of people feel the way you do. So that actually does make a change. So for every one letter, there's a thousand people that feel that so, way or so, something, so, something yeah, Exactly, like that. exactly. And, and, and it sort of goes exponentially down as you do uh, a phone call or a form letter and finally an email. Those, that's sort of the order of importance of your communication with an okay. elected official. And their food chain. Exactly, so exactly. And here, here in New York, I think a, a lot of uh, our elected officials are sympathetic to this issue. A lot of elected officials, certainly I, I live in Manhattan, and certainly my representatives are very um, uh, sort of in tune with the way that people feel, the majority of people feel in their, in their districts. Um, if that's the case, you can always contact your parents' elected officials, or the elected officials of, if you, especially if you grew up in that town, so, you know, to, to show them that you really do have a connection there. You know, and to encourage your parents and to encourage people in states like Ohio and Pennsylvania that are critical states uh, about this issue, basically, right. to, you know, to, to call them. No, don't even tell them what to say. You don't even have to advocate. Say what you for, feel. Yeah, just to say what you feel, exactly. Say what's in your heart. And that's the most effective communication. When you can speak of your personal experience from your heart or what you really believe in, that's what changes minds and that's what changes uh, awareness and consciousness. Okay, and speaking of awareness and consciousness, um, where can people find more information? And we will have links on the www.talkingabout.info website. Um, I'll, get, I'll get the links on the page on Friday. Um, and Certainly. So the, uh, the Wedding Party website is www.theweddingparty.org. It's, the, it's loaded with information. There, uh, there's everything that's in the news about marriage is updated daily uh, on our website. There's contact information for other groups on our website. Uh, and it's a great resource. Um, if people want to contact me personally, they can do it through my law firm, McKenna, Sirikasano, and Chinisi, and my number is 516-599-2020. Repeat it once more. That's 516-599-2020, uh, and it's McKenna, Sirikasano, and Chinisi. Okay. Um, we've got about two minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, Boy, the time flew. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and we were worried beforehand. Yeah, I know. Uh, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like just to, to uh, flesh out a little bit? Um, I would, love, I would love for people to 
empower themselves to speak up about how they feel. Uh, the, there's sort of a, I talk about it like four steps you can take to really do this. Check in with yourself, check your resolve, see if you really believe in it enough to talk about it. And if you do, talk about it. If you don't, write a letter, call somebody. Um, Arm yourself with the facts. Know, know about marriage. Know that there are 1,138 federal benefits and rights that are conveyed with marriage. Uh, know, you know how, how people have been discriminated against. And know that it's the children that really bear the burden of the discrimination. If you have this conversation, gear your conversation to the audience that you're having. If you know it's going to be a religious conversation, you know, ca ca understand that the, the Bible has very, very inconsistent treatment about marriage. Uh, you know, know that you may be, tr you know, people may try to deflect you with these moral, outrageous moral sensibility so arguments. Stay focused on, on the facts. Exactly. And finally, speak from your heart. That's the, if you speak from your heart, people will listen to you. Okay. And I, I've been listening to you for the last hour. <laughs> and we could go on for another hour, but unfortunately, we're just about out of time. And I want to thank you, Anthony Brown. Thank you very much, John, and for having me. I want to thank you, the viewer, for watching us today. Uh, you've been watching Talking About. You can find out more information on our website, which is www.talkingabout.info. That again is www.talkingabout.info. I'm John Griffith. Join us again next time. And thank you for watching. Good night. Cynthia Pizzulli, certified sex therapist and psychotherapist. I'd love an opportunity to answer your emails and letters on the air. So if you'd like to contact me, you can do so at AskDrCynthia at TalkingAbout.info or write to P.O. Box 20713, Floral Park, New York, 11002.